Hello and welcome to our Alexander McQueen Autumn Winter 24 Women's Wear Review. I'm Editor Hattie Malik and this is our Fashion Features Editor, Joshua Graham. Hi. So this is a biggie. We've kind of been rounding up all of the shows kind of day by day, but we thought it was important to really give space to this show. And we were thinking about this idea of how you deal with legacy at a brand. This was the first collection by Sean McGear, who's a 35-year-old Irish designer. Um, taking over from Sarah Burton, who looked after the house beautifully after Lee McQueen passed away in 2010. Um, Sarah, if you didn't know, also was kind of part of Lee's team. So this is the first time that a sort of outsider in quotation marks has come into this role at the house. Um, the design team has all stayed the same. And um, there's a new stylist, however, working on this, Marie Shea, who was working on this with Sean. But it is kind of a lot of the old team but what Sean was saying that he wanted to do was to bring new energy to kind of classic Lee McQueen kind of tropes, such as, for example, the tailoring, which is kind of the bread and butter of the house, um, Lee trained on Savile Row. Um, Sean did this interview with Nicole Phelps at Vogue before the show, which was quite interesting to read. I think it gave a lot about his kind of intentions for this kind of new energy that he wanted to bring, really pushing for definitely a younger consumer, um, really focusing on, I think Josh and I were both saying before, we were glad to see that he was saying, you know, he really wanted to focus on the clothes. Mm -hmm. So I think we're gonna, we're definitely gonna talk about and break down the clothes, but I think Josh and I wanna give our kind of initial thoughts before we start breaking this down. I think everyone was quite apprehensive after the kind of teaser campaign with the skull masks, which felt quite kind of, caricature-esque of kind of the McQueen skull motif and I must say that my initial thoughts and having slept on this on a couple after a couple of days are that I felt like this was a collection which is very much coming from someone who's grown up with an idea of McQueen an idea of kind of what that is but it came across as kind of re-editions which kind of I think without the emotion mm -hmm. and the drive of what Lee McQueen did they feel like rearing on insulting caricatures mm -hmm. um, and down. yeah watered down and I think the intention of bringing through design tropes and giving them new energy I don't think that that has been completely successful I don't think you can create the magic of what Lee McQueen did in some of the we're going to talk again we're going to break down this collection there were lots mm -hmm. of references to archive shows but I don't think you can bring through the magic of those shows and reduce it down to just design tropes because it's so much more than that yeah and I think we do have to preface this, and I think a lot of critics have prefaced this with saying that there's never going to be another Lee Alexander McQueen, right? Yeah. He, he was so singular in his vision and his talent, and having that expectation that somebody could swoop in and do exactly what he did and make us feel exactly the way we did when we first watched those shows is an impossible task. Mm -hmm. So I think when we're looking at this collection, again, this idea of legacy and brand building we're I mean the two of us aren't nostalgic sentimental individuals mm. thinking about this yeah it's not like we're kind of saying I think we're, we're still coming from this from a young perspective we're yeah. not saying you know we lived those shows and we can't bear to see it be anything else yeah but I did find it up I actually found this show quite upsetting I found it upsetting I found it really upsetting um I kind of knew <laughs> I knew the train wreck was going to happen the second these campaign images came out because it did feel like McQueen for Target it felt like um McHugh mm. the diffusion line because it was kind of these really watered down ideas or these really watered down tropes mm. of McQueen that were so easily identifiable like it's an observation of tropes mm -hmm. rather than coming from something lived yeah like having this show in this kind of underground car park which was definitely a reference to the McQueen show it's a jungle out there Sean was talking a lot in his preview interviews and backstage about this idea of like a tattered East London tattered opulence, tattered opulence there. Yeah. Um, and kind of people talking about that his mood board had pictures of kind of Amy Winehouse and Kate Moss but it very much felt like a mood board collection it, rather than something psychological yeah. and real which is what McQueen at his core is if it, you're going to return to that. It felt incredibly um, surface level it didn't feel like he was trying to tap into the ethos of what McQueen was doing and when I say that I mean what McQueen did was really he always outwardly said like he design clothes mm. to empower women and I think you could really see that in his collections but you could also see him hold a mirror to the realities of mm. women which 
was met with some criticism of misogyny, but really he was just revealing a reality. Yeah. I was into, I was re-watching um, a conversation that Susanna Frankel had with Nick Knight about one of the old McQueen collections, and it really struck me, Susanna said, McQueen's women were often quite scary, mm -hmm. and they were scary in their power. There was an aggression there. Yeah, and I think in this collection, especially, the models had these purposefully aggressive walks, kind of hands in their pockets, clutching themselves, heads down, angry. And instead of coming off as kind of forceful and powerful, and maybe trying to capture that aggressive and powerful nature of McQueen's women, it again came off as caricature, it came off cartoonish. as cartoonish and comical. Um, I mean, I think we should probably break down some of these looks, these archive references and some of the mm. ideas that we're kind of trying to make this design language more kind of energetic, as Sean was putting it, um, and less... He said backstage something that he w didn't want to be so polite. Anti-polite. This meant to be anti-polite. Um, but I actually found this collection actually very polite. Um, but yeah. let's let's kind of break this down. Shall we? Should we talk talk a bit about the archive? Yeah. In this, because I think that's a key key kind of reason to what we've kind of just been talking about about kind of doing cut and paste. Yeah. Um, Can I just say real quick that anti-politeness comment really rubbed me the wrong way because. I don't think McQueen has ever been polite. I don't think the mm. world right now is necessarily polite. I don't think fashion is really polite. Let's talk about some of the clothes and how mm -hmm. maybe then you can explain a bit about, I think, because I, I agree with you, I think that idea of politeness and anti-politeness, like that's kind of proven through the clothes mm -hmm. that came through. So look one was kind of this direct reference to Spring Summer 95, the birds. The Autumn Winter 24 was this black laminated jersey dress very much pulling on the kind of restrictive nature of that bird's collection, the kind of wrapped, kind of laminated effect of that collection. And then look two was kind of definitely tapping into the tailoring of the house with this T-bar chain necklace by Sean Lean, an incredible jewelry designer who worked with Lee. I think both of these looks are a good jumping place to start off, not just because they're the opening notes of the collection, but I think they kind of reflect what Sean tried and failed to do. The tailoring in this collection, as I mentioned at the beginning, tailoring is the bread and butter of this house. The tailoring, although it was, you know, it had the broad shoulders, kind of curved, animal-esque, mm -hmm. the cinched waist, the addition of hardware, it lacked the strength and the, again, the powerful aggression of, um, of Lee's women and the rawness of how he would... Ferocity. ...cut and, yeah, and... And the the nature of this dress as well again lacked lacked visceral feeling. Yeah. It lacked emotion to it. I don't think it was subversive. I don't think it tapped into kind of the perversion that McQueen was always tapping into, mm. especially with those early collections that Sean is referencing here. And I think that's always gonna happen if you're just gonna try and look at an archive and and kind of re-edition it right. without actually coming from a similar place of intention. Yeah. Or thinking where that came from, why that came from at that time, and then applying it for the now, mm. for the contemporary. I think there's definitely a misunderstanding that I gather from Sean's perspective about where Lee was coming from. Um, a comment that really rubbed me up the wrong way in his interview with Nicole, he spoke about that he didn't want this collection to be depressing. And I read that as if he's saying kind of the only thing that separates him and Lee is that there weren't that Lee had depression and mental health issues yeah, the that made him artist thing. the tortured artist thing and it's so you know I whether he really does insulting. feel like that or not it's you've got to be careful what you say because that's how it comes across yeah. and I think it's a total it in, it's indicative to me of a misunderstanding perhaps of of the kind of place that Lee was coming from and as we say we're not saying that Sean should be a replacement for Lee or become, no one's expecting him to come from that same place, but I think when you're seeing other designers and how they're dealing with legacy at other houses, I think there's a different, more respectful way um, to do it. You know, this collection, what continued was this attempt to kind of reinterpret and almost re-edition kind of archive McQueen for a new consumer. Um, you know, as I say, that tailoring, that strength, even in Look 29 when the great McQueen model Deborah Shaw walked, the subversiveness that was attempted through using kind of these horse hoof 
shoes and we'll put in some pictures because they've literally got kind mm -hmm. of the metal I don't know what that's called but a the horseshoe metal, yeah there's a like little, little horseshoes little on the on the soles which I thought was actually quite fun. yeah I do quite like them but you know I think it's indicative of this kind of caricature almost of that mm -hmm. subversiveness and um, that kind of horse hair was kind of a reference also to come spring summer 05 later in the collection we had these body molds which felt like a reference to the spring summer 05 kind of body mold dress mm -hmm. with horse hair for sean it was a more personal reference to his dad who's a car mechanic and these kind of sculpted dresses and then also the way they card yeah, dresses made from one car of the dresses pieces. was like the headlights of cars smashed up mm -hmm. and like applicated on to look like the shattered effect that's the thing i think this is coming from there's not a melding of Sean's point of view and the personal experience and then what he sees in the McQueen archive. I think actually if he'd gone really dove into like the personal perspective, maybe that would have felt more McQueen. Yeah. Because that's kind of what McQueen is. Um, other elements of kind of archive reinterpreted here was um, the lacing from the birds collection was kind of reinterpreted into being kind of belts or laced around the bottom of jeans. I think the jeans are probably the most example of the kind of consumer that he's trying to appeal to here, a very young consumer. I don't think that, I understand the archive reference there, but I don't think those jeans with the laced ankles live here. They live more in kind of the blue marine world, not yeah. here. It's also the thing of like, is this what the new McQueen is? A, a denim brand? And it's, it's a, and it's not. And it's not. Or nor house. should it be. And it's a tailoring house. And this collection was really just like a confusing, incoherent mishmash of ideas mm. um, that made no sense. Narrative has always been a really important part of, of Lee Alexander McQueen's process. And even and, Sarah would have these amazing yeah. stories. And there was a, there was no narrative here. It felt chaotic it so many ideas random. so many ideas it really could have used an edit because looking at these clothes up close at the Reese, it's not unsalvageable mm. right there are interesting ideas here it's just a lot i think also this in terms of ideas it's kind of like i think a great example is look 11 with the nylon kind of top all in shirts mm -hmm. layered under tailoring it's like you can see that using top all in there's this thought of you know on paper let's do this tattered opulence yeah. let's look at east london let's look at this high kind of, low yeah these kind of low fabrics and make them into shirts and tie them together with tailoring but actually on the runway it came across as it looked very cheap because you don't see where that mm -hmm. it's not like he's taken top all in and actually made it into something really really beautiful um maybe what could have been great is to do a top all in dress that could have been amazing like a woven top all in dress that could have been really really beautiful um, but yeah, I just think it comes back to this idea of just slightly missing the mark and all these different ideas not quite working together. Um, I also want to mention the leopard print section, I'm, the leopard print dresses and... I don't see it. I, I'm ignoring it. It's so I'm awful. Not, I'm not sure where that came from. I yet to find an archive reference to see where that came from. Again, maybe that lives more within the world of these kind of lace tied denim jeans for that younger consumer but I don't see how that lives in the world of McQueen and I'm not being nostalgic of old McQueen you know I can think about McQueen for the future but I don't know where that lives why you would go to McQueen for a mm -hmm. leopard print hoodie also it was just ugly mm. yeah it was, it ugly. was just ugly also what I thought was ugly was the neon yellow so the neon yellow kind of seemed to be a sort of again it was this this mishmash of branding, kind of the pre, mm -hmm. pre-show campaign, which had McQueen as a one word, but then they have mm -hmm. confirmed that it's still going to be Alexander McQueen. Then this kind of yellow, which was like with yellow blankets on our seats, and I wondered if this was like pulling from the issue, um, autumn winter two thousand show, the dress, which is kind of this neon green right. yellow, and I found it when I was going back through archive references, and I was like, maybe he's pulled it from that, but what it comes out of is like this highlighter green, yeah. which just feels... Or like this high-vis mechanic vest mm. workwear thing. And yeah. I think that was really... I think there were multiple <laughs> collections in this collection. I think there were... The ideas didn't make any sense. I think if you focused on this idea of, of the rough East End and kind of construction and, and car parts and autos, and mm. it would have been a completely different story than if he focused on just tailoring yeah. or just on these really amazing show-stopping pieces. That first fur look 
with the mm. really exaggerated silhouette I thought was really interesting. But within the context of this collection, it kind of felt like it was just slotted in there to be like, mm. here's a show-stopping piece yeah. without thinking, why is this yeah. a show-stopping piece? Why does this fit within mm. this context? I think there's just so many ideas here that's kind of the tailoring, then these kind of younger ideas, like the leopard, the kind of broken mirror t-shirt mm. someone on the front row is wearing a kind of version of this on a white t-shirt and it just looked like it looked like an h&m collab or something it was just like yeah Ugh. i'm gonna um push back a little on the comment you made about the tarpooling and that could be mm. a really interesting dress because the dresses he did do in this collection with the like broken mirror that he, i think he said was to mirror the broken screen of an iphone yeah. um or that headlight dress i don't think those silhouettes were were razor sharp, precise, no. interesting. So I couldn't see actually mm. a tarpooling dress being in That's what I mean, I just, I think maybe I was even thinking about it more in like the concept of, I don't think there's been any work from his side to work out how these materials work with the body. It's yeah. like, here's a silhouette yeah, and then yeah. later I'm gonna do this in this fabric, not thinking about yeah. how that affects one or the other while it's Lee was so yeah. about the body. Again, it's that big disconnect between, I think not understanding what the McQueen what McQueen the man and mm -hmm. what McQueen the brand is because while Lee Alexander McQueen kind of looked to punk and incorporated punk elements and the macabre and um, distressing and all of these kind of low influences there was always such a precision there there was mm. always such a razor sharp eye with everything he did and everything was so immaculate and, and, and perfect this really tapped into almost this London punk DIY thing, mm. which yes, but it was might also feel that a little idea young. of punk, which definitely comes. You know, I don't think McQueen. I don't know if Lee would have said he was no punk, and I think that I. Did. I think there's crossover there, but there mm. isn't. I don't think of McQueen really as punk. But like Sean probably does, or this collection does. This collection does, yeah. Um, I think just to kind of summarise some of these ideas that were going on, we kind of had the glowing skull bag in one of the dresses. No, it was a kind of a cape coat, and then kind of a queen skull with the breath on this LED light bag, and the broken mirror T-shirts. I've mentioned the jeans, the accessories, the hoof boots. Lots of these kind of ideas of kind of rebranding and re-editioning but then in the mix of all of this you could see Sean's work from JW Anderson where he was on the menswear team mm -hmm. um, where he's just come from you mentioned kind of showstoppers it was kind of these showstopper knit pieces and these kind of tufted shearling on wool looks in 34 and 35 those car dresses I mentioned in 51 and 52 and then the kind of knit cardigan skirts and mini tops which I just was very and that kind of was in the highlighter yellow I was mentioning just again what what's happening it made no <laughs> sense it was just this confusing again mishmash of ideas that had no relation to each other at all this didn't feel like a collection this didn't feel like a show this felt like a mood board of ideas and yeah i don't that's exactly i don't was. think about mcqueen the brand as a mood board of ideas mm. um i think the last kind of controversial creative director debut that i can think about is Eddie Saman at Saint Laurent and I think the difference there is that collection he did was a real homage this really edited homage to the tried and true codes of, of YSL he focused on the smoking jacket and these breezy wispy dresses and of course those like big giant hats that were like 70s week gauche and it's very interesting to see that Sean did not take that route he, he went the throwing everything out on the runway route. And I think this would be a completely different story and a completely different reaction if he focused on one, two of his big ideas. Yeah. I think this collection and the reception to this collection would be very different if he focused on tailoring, um, if he focused on creating a real clear direction for where he wants to bring McQueen, because I actually have no idea what his direction mm. is at this point. I think the word that just keeps coming back to me is it feels like this quite self-righteous re-edition mm -hmm. re feeling to it, um, which takes all the feeling out of it and just... It was emotionless. It was emotionless and I think it would also be a different collection if it felt like there were actual real new ideas in the mix of this. 
but it felt I think why I use the why I use the phrase self-righteousness because it felt like this kind of pillaging of random ideas from the archive and not actually giving them any new intentional yeah. direction. I think that's all I have to say about this collection. I think I agree with you. I think next season I'd like to see a refining down and real focusing yeah. on like one or two ideas rather than I think this mismatch. I think I've seen a lot of, of people say that like, well, I'll wait till the next collection before I make a decision. And I find that really frustrating because it is that thing in fashion again where it's like, who are we giving patience to? Who are we giving mm. second chances to? And it's, for me, it always comes down to the same kind of white male designer that is is warranted that grace. Mm. And I find that really frustrating. So yes, obviously I mean, we should be giving patience to these creatives and debuts are mm. very difficult. And he was really put in an impossible situation here following but Sarah who's also, been there. But also it's like, I think a key thing that we've said is that I think what is most upsetting is there's this lack of strength and emotion to this McQueen, first and foremost, the McQueen woman. This was mm -hmm. a co-ed collection, but primarily that's what you're looking for from McQueen and that's what McQueen gives you. And Sarah did it in her own way, but it was, always this strong woman mm -hmm. and I do think I'm not saying men can't design for women that's definitely not the case but this is indicative of sometimes what happens yeah. when you know I mean Lee was obviously a man yeah. but but he had a real understanding of, of yeah of and it's women and femininity it feels like this is a designer who doesn't um, and Agreed. doesn't really has a lack of understanding about the particular type of beauty that the McQueen brand is about. And I saw one person said, you know, hard job for him, someone's got to do it. And it's like, but do they? I know that Kering are not gonna let go of like the McQueen kind of golden egg that they yeah. have. But I just, you know, sometimes I just wish we could let these brands just rest because I felt like when I was watching this show, I felt like it was such a smear on the name of McQueen. Exactly, I think we, why do we continue, obviously the stakeholders and the money and brands make money but why like when we really think about it we keep the McQueen brand alive to keep the legacy of this man alive that's mm. what we do for all of these brands so to see it kind of reduced into these really watered down ideas a to product, try they've a become product, product of product of, yeah. of and that feels so against it the feels core of it McQueen. makes me mad it makes me <laughs> frustrated yeah to see it like watered down to tap into a younger consumer to do all it it's, to market it to market it. it it's for all the wrong reasons so and solid. i think this is really i've never been that person but this is the first time i'm like you know what mcqueen did say when i'm gone burn the house to the ground <laughs> and maybe we should maybe yeah. we should because this had this does nothing but tarnish the man's legacy yeah i agree and yeah i mean i'm sure that, that he will do another season and you know, in that hope, I hope that it's a refining down and that there's some clearer view on what McQueen, what he intends for McQueen to be. But sadly, this missed the mark for us. And I hope that we've given you some understanding as to why and also to why there's been such a negative reaction around this show. Um, but we would love to hear what everyone else thinks. Um, so let us know in the comments below. And thank you so much for watching and we will see you for more reviews very shortly.